Good afternoon, and today is Thursday, October 27th. Live from Washington, D.C. at Venable LLP, we welcome you to our webinar, CFPB Supervision and Enforcement, Thinking About Overlap. My name is Jonathan Pompan, and I'm a partner and co-chair of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Task Force here at Venable. If you're a compliance officer or a legal counsel at a consumer financial services company, the two world words most likely to keep you awake at night our CFPB and examination. Now, going into its fifth year, the Bureau has settled into its role as the primary supervisor of consumer financial products and services for many industries, including auto lending, debt collection, and buying mortgages, student loans, small dollar and short term loans, credit card products, and many more, as well as, of course, banks. For compliance officers and legal counsel, the prospect of a CFPB examination can be daunting. The luminous document requests several months of on-site visits, and the potential for remediation and penalties in the event of significant identified deficiencies. So to help to get you up to speed, we're joined by my colleagues and the co-authors of Preparing and Surviving a CFPB Examination, Andrew Biggert. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining today. And Alexandra McGarris. Greetings from rainy and cold New York. And a spectacular uh, guest today, uh, Gary Reeder, Managing Director of Chainbridge Partners and the first Chief of Staff at the CFPB. Gary. Thanks for joining us, and I look forward to answering any questions you have. So, uh, Andrew, Alex, and Gary, before we jump into the discussion today, I do have a small bit of housekeeping to do. And uh, first off, for folks on the line, our webinar today will be recorded. It will be downloadable, and the slides are also going to be available. Uh, not only via email and on our website, but also on YouTube later this week. Uh, please follow the on-screen prompts for submitting questions, and we'll do our best to incorporate them into our discussion and remind you periodically of the opportunity to ask us questions. That's going to be through the portal uh, on your web screen. Of course, contacting us and asking questions doesn't create an attorney-client relationship or a business relationship with Gary and the opinions expressed today are those of the individual attorneys and guests. So please don't send us confidential information or anything really specific to your business, but we're happy to answer general questions and of course take questions offline as well. And also, today's session is going to be for CLE. So stay tuned until the very end for the CLE code. Information about the CLE certificate will automatically be sent to all attendees after today's session. So no need to email after asking for that certificate. Within a few hours, there will be an email that will go out with information about that, uh, and you'll be able to do uh, what you need to do with your individual states for CLE. Today we will be exploring several topics, including how the CFPB's Revision Enforcement and Fair Lending Division, referred to as CEFO, is organized and the roles played by both the Office of Enforcement and the Office of Supervision, strategies for navigating supervision examinations, appealing examination findings and ratings, and averting public enforcement actions, and of course the differences between the two offices within the division and how to interact with each. Each of us here on the panel have had varying experiences counseling and advising clients on these issues, uh, including in, in Gary's case, the CFPB it, itself. Uh, and our goal today, of course, is to inject those experiences into the discussion so that you all can benefit from them. Yeah, and as we've seen these themes play out countless times, Alex, uh, in our work preparing and defending companies and examinations, and also, of course, in, in the instances where there's been investigations and enforcement actions, the overlap becomes really important. I know that we've seen that. Andrew, you've seen that work as well. Uh, in your experiences, uh, how would you see this play out for companies now that we're five, six years into the CFPB? Well, I think what's interesting um, about the CFPB and its, its dual authorities here of uh, supervision, examinations, and enforcement is that it makes it a lot different than what you might see from the Federal Trade Commission, for example, which doesn't have that examination authority. And with the CFPB having such broad uh, jurisdiction over, um, you know, starting with banks and then moving over to non-banks, you get a lot of entities that haven't been um, in a supervisory situation before. And, you know, the examination process is really 
um, a long-term relationship between these companies and the CFPB, and it's therefore really important for maintaining that. And then again, though, you've got um, an agency that's shown itself to have pretty aggressive enforcement instincts at times. And so I think the challenge for a lot of these companies is how do you kind of balance and manage those two processes? And Gary, you, you were there at the beginning. Uh, first Chief of Staff uh, in 2012, New York Times writes the article from, from, from North Carolina to MBA to D.C. How does that journey work when most of D.C., for folks on the line, is, is thought of as, as attorneys, lobbyists, and, and government officials that have been here for a long time? Sure. So I, I ended up coming to D.C. as part of the TARP program. A number of people came from, uh, from Wall Street to help with the Treasury, so I helped run the um, auto bailout program. And while I was there, I thought I would um, return to New York to an asset management, but the uh, Treasury Department was responsible for setting up the CFPB. And I had experience as an investor in consumer finance for about eight years. So I um, decided to stay on and help build the agency. And in, in relation to what you're talking about, we were pr very purposeful in blending supervision and enforcement together into one office. One, we thought that both sides would have something to learn from each other. They, they tend to be very uh, stovepiped at other organizations, or uh, as was pointed out earlier, they, they might not even have dual authorities. The other thing you'll see here is that often enforcement goes through a single legal division that would also include rulemaking. It was very purposeful when the CPD was built to have a separate regulations department, a separate enforcement department, and a separate legal department, all of which report to the director as opposed to everything going through a single attorney um, that would have oversight of all the sort of legal decisions that the, that the organization makes. So a highly intentional design, um, blending both uh, enforcement, supervision, uh, also, fair lending, uh, which is a constant theme, not only in the lending area, but also with the CFPB itself and its activities over the last five years. Now, originally, the supervision activities were sort of this dual responsibility with uh, up, up to in terms of how it was structured, where you had the uh, a reorganization sort of uh, very early on where the activities were sort of enhanced for efficiency and effectiveness, where supervision was sort of sliced into two. Yes. What was that about? Yeah, I think um, one of the things we realized early on is that um, unlike the prudential regulators, who some of them had more than 100 years of experience examining institutions and thus had uh, processes in place that were somewhat efficient but certainly predictable, we were stuck in a world where we were trying to simultaneously design supervision policy that would cut across a bank and a non-bank so that they'd be treated equally, but also trying to move examinations through the process in such a way that the examining institutions could have some certainty about when the exams would be completed. And we made the determination that having those being headed by separate people would um, allow someone to concentrate on getting the policy consistent, have someone else be focused on getting the trains to run on time. Um, the other change that happened after that, but was also related was uh, you know, uh, related institutions were very upset that enforcement attorneys were accompanying examiners on on site. They um, sure were. Yes, uh, there was a fair amount of um, upset about that, and so that was restructured as well. Um, and so all of those things were changed, but the overall idea of keeping all of these in in one division and having one person head that and report to the director that had stayed the same. But I think changes for efficiency and also recognizing some of the expectations of regulated entities plus issues around certain types of legal protections and what's the best way for an examiner to get the information they need, all of those things have shifted. What, what I will say also was the reason for that shift in structure was we had bank and non-bank supervision at the time, and that was very, very hard to figure out how you would actually do that. It was much easier to have a group of people who focus on products. The Bureau is very focused on consumers and products, not someone's legal charter. So if you have policy folks who are focused on mortgage servicing, anytime there's a mortgage servicing exam or an institution that's a mortgage servicer, those people are the expert, as opposed to this person's a bank examiner, this person's a non-bank examiner, but they're looking at the same consumer or the same product. Right, so a balance of substance and skills. And then from a, a standpoint, just to recap for folks, you get supervision divided into two examinations and policy, uh, obviously examinations implementing the policy, going out, doing the fact findings on the ground, writing the reports, 
and then they get blended in with what the policy agenda is right. in terms of interpretations. Yeah, and it's a good resource for examiners so that you don't have, in many cases, fresh examiners because there's not enough of a supply of examiners out there. You're always bringing in new people. You didn't want examiners who are inexperienced making decisions, particularly about UDAP on site. They needed to have a consolidated policy infrastructure back at headquarters where those examiners could refer back to make sure that there's some consistency. That's, that's probably a good way to kind of move on to the next slide, talking about some of the different regions that are out there and the um, kind of interaction between these, these four regions and the headquarters when it comes to um, uh, managing examinations and the policy implications behind that. Yeah, I think the main thing that people should be aware of is that all policy decisions get made in D.C. I would say across all of the banking agencies that has become the case, you know, the FDIC, the Fed, the OCC have all consolidated supervisory powers into Washington and, and sort of de, um, uh, sort of de-regionalized their approach. But I think for clients, the most important thing to realize is that the relationships over the long run with examiners occur at the regional level. So the regional director of the West, it's important to know that person and know the examiner in charge because that's the long-term relationship. They may not have complete control over the policy decisions, but it is their obligation to oversee your institution. And if they are ever in a position where they're being surprised or they don't have full understanding of your who's making decisions, it puts a lot of pressure back on them from Washington uh, and then they begin to get questions that make their job hard. So I always say to clients, know the regional director if possible if you can't. Knowing the examiner in charge is very important um, because they are your main point of contact. Uh, after that, if your other point of contact would be an enforcement office, that's a very different relationship than you would have um, with your exam team. And, and just to jump in there, so oftentimes when we're advising you know, clients about how to, how to manage um, an examination from you know, the, the first day letter or the information request all the way through to kind of um, you know, responding to preliminary findings, et cetera, you know, we're always kind of thinking you know, who is the audience? And of course, the uh, individual examiners, the examiner in charge, and those that um, you know, lead the, the specific uh, regional office under which your uh, entity falls are, you know, they're extremely important. Um, and not, not, not just from a day-to-day -day perspective, but as Gary mentioned, it is a long-term relationship. And that for many non-banks that have not been traditionally supervised, that's a, a very new concept that there is an ongoing relationship that it's not just a, you know, a one-time um, event, um, but that going forward, you have to maintain that relationship and keep information flowing, hopefully in two directions. That said, um, you know, the, the folks in Washington are very much um, involved both behind the scenes, but also you know, bring, you know, driving the policies to ensure consistency across all the regions and examinations, but you know, very heavily involved. And so that audience also needs to be kept in mind when responding to information, when you know, talking to your, the examiners that are on site and trying to kind of persuade them of, of how to interpret um, a specific set of facts, et cetera. Yeah, I would say the most practical advice I give people is that you've created a data environment uh, and an overall compliance management system where you can readily produce information in the format and the context in which um, the examiner needs to produce it, that greatly reduces the tension between the institution um, and the regulator. And I think for many non-banks, this is just not something you have experience with, and the CFPB is asking for new things in new ways. But I help clients do that a lot because if the data environment is structured to be productive and efficient, one, it takes less strain on the, on, on the regulated entity, but it builds trust. Because we all know, one yeah, you want to make it as easy for the examiners in some respects as possible, as, as seamless and smooth, so that they can understand and do their job. Right. Because unlike compliance management in the past, what usually is happening at the bureau today is just a massive data request. The data is going to the data management and data science teams within research and within supervision, and the examiners are often not touching much of that information. But from a production standpoint, they're held accountable for making sure that this exam hits certain thresholds of time. Keep in mind, once an exam is looked at by the CPB, if it's a bank, it has to then go to the FDIC or OCC 
or the Fed, uh, because they also get to opine on that exam. So an examiner who's caught trying to extract information from you is going to get bound up with a lot of pressure, and then that's going to cause more resources to come to try to get the information. And so a lot of clients think that they just cut and paste the exam manual for their particular product into their CMS, and they're able to satisfy that all on its face seems sufficient, I think it is not a bad place to start, but will not keep, no, will not have you prepared for day one, day 20, day 45, where you still have to really produce information. Or year six or seven, like we're coming up on. Uh, now, one of the things that's really unique with the Bureau, although it's, and it's certainly starting to set in, but is this concept of consumer focus as opposed to, let's even say, company or market or business focus, as Director Cordray has said himself, they have a somewhat unique approach. They are examining institutions for how they treat consumers, and that is a, a, it's a different angle, a different perspective than the prudential regulators had. It's really different than state regulators to the extent that non-banks may already have some state supervision around them. Um, and certainly for, for some companies, it, it, it's a shift in um, culture. So a, a lot of companies will spend uh, hundreds and uh, thousands of dollars, millions of dollars on internal culture programs, um, but perhaps you know, the external audience, the consumer audience, might not see that uh, because it may be a service provider, it may be someone who is having their products uh, resold, say through auto dealerships or something like that, where you don't have full control over the consumer experience. What the CFPB is really looking at, though, is this soup to nuts, how is the consumer treated from the beginning to the end of their experience with the company, and then presumably for, with respect to their data, forever. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I, I talk to clients a lot about, I think this is the most profound shift um, in the way that regulation occurs for consumer protection, because historically, compliance was a um, disclosure input-based system. As long as you had the right pieces of paper at the right time disclosed to the right person, the outcomes were really, they were important, but they were not crucial. I would say the Bureau has flipped that on its head and said two things. One, um, it's about the outcome of the consumer. All of the right forms at the right time and all the disclosures in the world will not solve a bad consumer outcome. And second, the powers of UDAP um, allow you to take a much more principles-based approach where most statutory consumer protection law is really about disclosure. Um, and so I talked to clients a lot about taking a principles-based approach to product design and then using a lot of data to look at what's happening to the consumer throughout the life cycle. I think for a lot of people, um, and you see it in servicing, for, for much of consumer finance, once the sale is made and the person's in the system, historically then the system just did what the system Just did. an account number. Yeah, it was just transactions. The Bureau, the Bureau basically says from the moment you ever even market to a person to the moment that they theoretically die and that their financial data is sitting at some uh, bureau. Somebody is responsible for the integrity of all that and ensuring that the consumer, what the consumer is promised and what the consumer is uh, authorized to expect under the law, we're going to hold everyone in that chain accountable. And as we all know, there are dozens of third parties to every single transaction, no matter how simple it is, just because of this interconnectedness between the payment system, the credit system, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and what we've observed, too, is, is one of the most significant things that companies can do going into an examination. And usually the exam information requests allow for this, but even if it doesn't, is to get the story of the company out front to the examiners who may not know anything about the company except what they've heard anecdotally or seen on the web, and to also to sync the internal and external images of the corporate culture and the consumer experience. So one of the neatest things I've seen is, is uh, uh, companies that have taken basically their internal culture books and made them external, add some transparency to that, so people can see soup to nuts what the company is about, what the fabric of the company is, not from a PR standpoint, but literally from an operations standpoint, remove a little bit of that mystique, but at the same time, you, you end up educating the examiners so that way uh, you know, they, have, they know the right questions to ask and understand the context for that data that they're getting. Right. I also think uh, it's helpful, and this, this I, I know worries clients, um, particularly in our enforcement context, but I advise clients to also, wherever appropriate, to show the vulnerability 
uh, that comes along with trying to run a complex institution. That, you know, here are the things that we think we're doing well, here are the things that are not going well, here's the things that we're trying to do. I think, you know, the Bureau comes in looking at complaints. Complaints are a complicated um, way to look at the world. They're, they tend to be skewed in all kinds of ways, but that shapes the Bureau. I found my clients who come forward during an exam or during a conversation with the Bureau reflecting back what they've learned from the complaints, what they, what they think the costs are to make those changes, and just being very explicit about the struggles between having a perfect consumer experience and being able to have a profitable institution, having some um, transparency, as you're saying, around things like that, I think create a, a sense of not us versus them, but if you really want to have good consumer outcomes, it has to be sustainable to the institution. And the more the institution can help examine or understand the tension there and how you're trying to balance those tensions, I think you can get to a, to a better place. Yeah, and have better fact-finding. Um, that being said, the Bureau does have yes. some significant enforcement authority. Um, and an article that we recently published on our website, we uh, uncovered the CFPB's internal enforcement manual, which is distinct from the examinations manual, which makes it clear that the enforcement attorneys are in the background all along advising on exams, about advising on outcomes, taking a look at the findings, and collectively everybody's making a determination as to whether or not to bring, uh, bring an enforcement action as opposed to something perhaps less onerous if there's any infractions discovered during the exam. So that, that fact finding is really important. But Andrew, the consequences uh, and the scope of the CFPB's authority for enforcement are broad. Yeah, no, it, it, uh, it's uh, an organization that certainly has um, jurisdiction over a lot of different areas. So if you're a, a company in the financial services space, um, it's very likely that you know, you're know you not only subject to the CFPB's jurisdiction, but you're going to be subject to it under a number of different laws probably. Um, I think it's something like 18 different um, specific consumer protection laws that the uh, Bureau has authority over. And then again, it's got its, its unfair, deceptive, and abusive acts and practices authority. Um, which um, it interprets very, uh, very broadly as well. Um, and it certainly, um, you know, what's interesting, I think, kind of going back to um, what Gary, some of the co Gary's comments earlier, you know, it started off with the pers uh, perspective of having enforcement and examination um, in the same uh, unit and um, kind of working um, uh, in tandem in a lot of different ways. And when you combine that with the mindset of the consumer comes first, I think it can be difficult for companies, or at least companies have had some difficulty transitioning to this mindset that it's not just enough to comply with you know, some of the statutes that are up here on paper, or maybe even in practice to comply with them. If, um, if the con ultimate consumer outcome is not what the Bureau would want it to be, the UDAP authority is there to come in and say, um, you've got a problem here and, and we think changes need to be made. Yeah, I would agree that. Now, um, Alex, what we've seen, uh, and certainly this has been borne out in some of the matters that we've had where there's been even appeals of examination pending, is, is that the CFPB will take the, uh, the enforcement authority, run with it with respect to exam findings, um, perhaps a, a, attempt to do a, a remedy, but that, that the underlying law is really important that you know ultimately in some cases it is technical readings of statutes like EFT electronic funds transfer act or the fair debt collection practices act that do have precedent and should be important H how does that play out here when you've got also some pretty significant remedies that the CFPB can use yeah well sure so so companies that um, are subject to this to supervision and examinations by the CFPB always need to be mindful that the enforcement um, authority is coterminous with that. So, you know, findings um, from an exam um, absolutely uh, can result in a, in a public law enforcement action. And the Bureau's um, ability to, to bring those actions, and as we talked about, its jurisdiction for that is, is extremely broad. Um, and they've demonstrated um, certainly a willingness to, to, to use that, in other words, um, to, to take the information that um, has been um, gathered and, and analyzed by you know, first examiners 
Um, and then, you know, the, the, the folks in, in headquarters that um, assist the examination process, but also enforcement attorneys who are involved um, behind the scenes throughout the entire process. And they're making determinations as to whether or not something, um, you know, should stay on what I, how I describe it on the, on the other side of the line with, with supervision or should cross the line and, and, and you know, be a, an enforcement action whether you know in, engaging in settlement discussions and um, ultimately the potential to uh, enter into a mutual, you know, negotiated settlement or the filing of a lawsuit, and that and that line um, is not is not very clear. I mean, you can spend a lot of time uh, parsing all of the enforcement uh, matters that have been have been brought to date and get glimpses as to which ones kind of. Uh, started, initiated as an exam, the ones that clearly didn't. It's very difficult to, and you, you know, you see some practices that were called out and, uh, you know, resulted in public enforcement action. And then you read the supervisory highlights where they're describing anonymously observations that were uh, made during exams, and you're saying, well, what, what tips? What tip the scale in, in, in certain in, in one case or not? And it's it's very difficult to, to predict, and so a lot of what companies that are uh, under examination are fearful of and constantly kind of preoccupied with is um, making sure that it doesn't cross that line. And, and it's oftentimes, and we'll talk about that this soon, um, and that you know have results consequently and inadvertently um, make the examination process more difficult because they're trying to. Um, you know, prevent certain information from being, um, you know, turned over or, you know, trying to put up walls when there should be more transparency and cooperation and making you know, distinctions between when to do that and not to do that is, is really difficult. And, and it's because, and it's because of the, the, the consequences and the stakes are so high. Yeah, that, um, those are great points, Alex. And it, it, it makes me think, you know, kind of talking about balancing the the legal analysis of these statutes and what the penalties are and what the risks are um, makes me think kind of to some of the uh, two of the, the holdings in the recent uh, PHH v. Uh, uh, CFPB case in the D.C. Circuit. Um, you know, that case got a lot of attention, just came out a, a few weeks ago uh, because uh, the D.C. Circuit found that the CFPB single director structure was unconstitutional, but maybe a little bit lost in the decision there was um, kind of some substantive issues that the court addressed that I think go right to the heart of, you know, how do you balance some of the tricky issues once you're in an examination and looking towards enforcement. And um, basically the, the court said that um, the CFPB in that, in that case had violated uh, the defendant's due process rights by kind of applying a novel legal theory to past actions without providing due process. And so, of course, that might be the type of thing you would see in an examination where uh, maybe examiners come in, they find something that they don't like from a consumer perspective, but it's not something that the company was really familiar with from a legal obligation. You know, is there fair notice then? Um, and then the other point that was raised in that case, too, had to go with, you know, the statute of limitations um, in administrative actions um, for the CFPB. The CFPB had tried to take, in, take the position that there were no statute of limitations in their administrative actions, and the court said, no, you know, that, that's not true. And that issue of, of statute of limitations is a key driver sometimes in looking at, um, you know, what the restitution might be in an examination or whether it's worth litigating something or not, you know, how far back would you have to look for um, penalties and restitution. And those are really difficult decisions that, um, that you know, compliance and in-house counsel and their outside counsels have to deal with. Yeah, let's take a, a step over to the examination process itself and how that unfolds because it's really significant. As, you know, anything done early on can have consequences later. Um, obviously, there's a look back with an exam. It's not necessarily looking forward at all. It will have forward implications. But that process starts you know, very early on when the CFPB scopes its exams, usually you do a two-year, three-year look back. Um, in some cases, they may be narrow. In some cases, they may be broad. Um, in some cases, they might be off-site, although more often than not, they're going to be on-site for a lot of time. Um, but that initial fact-finding becomes critical to then what goes into the uh, matrix in terms of determining whether or not there's any legal violation or matters requiring attention. 
Um, as somebody in our audience just asked, you know, are there ever examinations that don't lead to findings uh, that are enforcement worthy? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, but are there issues that need to potentially be remediated that could be found? That, that could be the case too. Um, how companies deal with that and the context that they put them in uh, with respect to both the facts, the law, and their corporation's uh, activities it can become very critical to whether or not something turns into a full-blown enforcement action, a consent order that's uh, confidential or a memo of understanding uh, to just matters requiring attention and still getting a, a four or a five rating. Yeah, I would say this is a place where the bank-non-bank -bank divide is still very hard to close because there is a certain conservatism embedded in doing an exam of a bank by the CTV because they have to get sign off by the prudential regulator on the exam. And so that in of itself creates a certain mechanism for one, keeping things within supervision because it would need to also go out to enforcement in the prudential regulator, which there's a lot higher gate to that. Second, <coughs> the prudential regulators have enormous powers over banks, both in terms of going backward in time, but either charging higher insurance fees. Um, I mean, they, they do have the power to pull your charter. Um, they don't do it, but they do have that authority. In the non-bank space, I would say it goes to enforcement more often because there isn't the same kind of remedy. And I would say some of the clients just don't have experience. There's not a, a way to do this because in the banking system too, once an examiner in charge says to bank A, you have this problem, it's very easy at a place like the OCC to have all the examiners of all the institutions go and tell that to them. They handle that behind the scenes. The Bureau can't do that writ large for non-banks. There's just too many institutions. So you do end up in enforcement more on the space. Yeah, I think that's, uh, just uh, Gary's point, I think, is that these examinations don't happen in a vacuum, um, whether it's that, you know, historical context that, you know, the prudential regulators have, you know, the primary responsibility for over 100 years to, to regulate these banks um, or, the, you know, given regulatory climate in a given industry or a company's history with uh, both the CFPB and other regulators to how, uh, you know, a company has been dealing with their complaints for the last five years. There's, there's so much context um, and other factors that influence kind of how an exam um, unfolds, so, how, you know, how a company is treated during the, during the examination, but also that impacts the outcome. And so, it, again, as mentioning, you know, you, a similar practice can be observed in one company and another company, and it could have a different impact, different outcome depending on all those factors and also how the company itself um, um, conducts itself when interacting with uh, the representatives of the, of the Bureau. Yes, maybe now would be kind of a good point um, to, to walk the folks on the webinar through just some basics in terms of procedure of how um, an examination works for those that haven't necessarily been through one before. Um, essentially, you know, once um, the Bureau uh, decides uh, that they want to examine um, your company, you know, they'll send out uh, an information request, which um, if you've ever gotten a uh, civil investigative demand, for example, from the FTC or another agency, um, it'll look somewhat similar. It's going to be, um, you know, probably a pretty big document that, um, has a lot of different questions, uh, requests for information, you know, kind of requests for written uh, descriptions, production of documents. Um, it'll let you know up front, um, you know, what specific consumer financial issues that they're there to look at you for, whether it's um, your debt collection activities, your fair credit reporting activities, you know, maybe, maybe all of the above if you're a large organization that, um, that kind of covers a lot of ground. They'll let you know, that, you know what the start date will be, the time period, uh, that's under review, who the examiner will be, um, whether it's going to be on-site or off-site, um, deadlines for responding, instructions, et cetera. Um, so that's really, you know, the event that kicks off uh, an examination. And I think that um, from our perspective, and maybe, maybe Alex, this is something that you could kind of jump in on. I think our, our experience has been that, you know, the most successful examinations are the ones where you, you are very proactive from the, from the get-go and you kind of hit the ground running in order to, uh, to make them run smoothly. Yeah, and just two points before we, we turn to the next slide, which will deep into, jump deeper into those points. 
one, we're, I, increasingly we're seeing um, examinations and, and therefore the corresponding information requests to be um, you know, more targeted and narrow in scope. Um, so whether it's a result of because a, a company has um, many different lines of business or different arms, um, you know, the examinations are you know, focusing on just one segment at a time or because you know, multiple years have passed and examinations have already proceeded. And so then the follow-up exam or the next exam is looking at more narrow issues either as a result of the previous examination because they couldn't get to something in time or because that's where uh, certain weaknesses were previously identified. Um, also seeing uh, for companies that um, have entered into consent orders, we're seeing um, you know, examinations that specifically target compliance with, with, those, with those agreements. So, so you, there's, a, there's a variety of, of possibilities depending on, on where your company sits. Uh, the second point is you, know, you usually get upfront notice as to where uh, the examiners will be visiting uh, for, for companies that have multiple locations. This is obviously very, very important just logistically. Um, we've seen, um, I think, very recently that uh, examination teams are, are starting to go abroad where companies have offshore operations. I, I, I'm pretty sure this is very new um, to the Bureau. And so you know, now that they've broken that ground, it's likely to accelerate going forward. Um, so you know, almost every exam involves um, both an off-site and an on-site component. And with respect to off-site, I mean, this is just the examination team, um, you know, reviewing the materials that it received both from the company, but that it would have um, potentially gathered from other sources, including its own file, um, if the if the entity had already been examined. Um, and so, you know. Hopefully, <laughs> by the time the examination team does show up on site, they've, um, they've, they've caught up to speed, um, have reviewed the materials that the company uh, laboriously put together. Um, but oftentimes, that's not the case. And the on-site is really the start of the examination in earnest. And during the on-site portion, um, of, you know, of course, for those of you that have been through this, it's it's very unique. It's extremely disruptive in that you have a team of um, individuals um, that are your regulators um, kind of be embedded within the company for weeks, oftentimes months at a time, and oftentimes are very demanding. Um, and so they're asking a lot of questions, asking to meet with a lot of people, oftentimes the you know, full day, um, you know, dealing with those, those one-off requests. And then when they, when they go home, um, the company gets you know, a, a list of follow-up questions that they need to turn around in writing in the next several days. So it's, it's, a, it's a constant um, feedback loop of you know, supplying them information, helping them digest it and analyze it, because oftentimes things are not self-explanatory. Um, and then also um, dealing with requests for, you know, for data oftentimes. Um, there's a lot of transactional testing that happens on site. So whether you're operating anything that's like a call center um, or you know, a, a consumer account information that's often updated on a regular basis, all of that is being accessed by the exam examiners while on site. And they also are doing a lot of um, interfacing with the business, with the business people. So it's, it's very rare where you're going to have the examiners only interfacing um, and downloading with those in like a compliance or legal role. They absolutely want to observe um, the you know, regular business operations, but also do some interviewing or you know, be presented by uh, managers that are subject matter experts on the various practices um, that, that, that they're looking at. So this is an opportunity for them to, to really um, to get under the hood and understand their operation. And I think what's unique here is, is examinations allow for a deep dive, not just on the facts, but then also they apply the law to those facts. And there's still a lot of anxiety that exists amongst companies, and rightly so, 
because these facts that are being produced in response to these information requests are going to be matched up against both the law and the expectations of the CFPB that have been announced in all of these different ways, including in public enforcement actions. And in some cases, the companies may not agree with the positions that the Bureau has taken. Uh, and some of those enforcement actions take in the auto and finance area. You've got uh, positions that have been taken about fair lending and the uh, ability to offer add-on products that um, simply are different than what had previously been the case. And so I think what's really critical is, is not to consider the information request as just benign opportunities to data dump, but rather opportunities to put your facts in the best possible situation. When companies do that, add in the rationale, tie it back to their policies and procedures that they had that were well-reasoned and reflective of what the law required them to do, or what was allowable under the law, um, you can go a long way to, to shaping what ultimately can be the outcome. And that may be through also interviews of employees, as well as also, uh, as Alex mentioned and, and Gary's mentioned, a, a look at data that in a vacuum may mean one thing, but when context is added to the data, say for instance an additional column that perhaps wasn't asked for, um, the examiners and the folks at headquarters might see that in a completely different light. And I think always drawing it back where we're possible to what happens to the consumer and what were the alternative outcomes for the consumer and that when you took this approach, you took it with an informed view of trying to improve those outcomes. I think just dropping transactional data on people without showing that you tried, Fairlane is a good example where, you know, there is a business purpose test and to be able to demonstrate that you looked at disparate impact versus business purpose and you had a regimented way about thinking about that problem or when you were servicing, these were the five different ways you serviced, you found in these four situations that it was worse than the other. Even if the fifth is still seen as some kind of violation, it still demonstrates that in good faith you're trying to find better consumer outcomes. That is a much better argument to be having. Also, if you have a principles-based structure, so I work with clients to sort of develop a UDAP framework internally to say, okay, this is the framework we use. Let's talk about why you don't agree with this framework as opposed to you don't like these facts or this is a bad outcome. It's more procedures and policies but taken it to a more principles-based level. That then it becomes a frame for the data as opposed to just I don't like that this happened to these four consumers. Well, the other, you know, the other big risk that can happen, which I think kind of goes to both of the points that were just made, too, is, you know, one of the worst outcomes you can have in an exam is a misunderstanding on behalf of the examiners because um, the facts that were presented just weren't complete. As Jonathan mentioned, you let, maybe left out some data that could have been very important. Or uh, maybe to your point, Gary, they, you didn't tie it all together with some of the other aspects of your program and really explain how you got there. And once, um, you know, one of the difficult things is that, you know, once examiners, um, or maybe the CFPB back at headquarters have a particular view as to the facts and what they think is happening, it can sometimes be very difficult to move them off of that view um, within the examination. And that can create some really difficult uh, problems for a company. And, and how, how do you, you know, prevent that examination from going into an enforcement or maybe a matter requiring attention that isn't actually um, you know, the right fit for, for what's actually happening? Yeah, I think the, the, really the best way to um, maximize the chances of having a, a, a solid, favorable outcome of an examination is to be as proactive as possible. Um, some exam teams make that easy because they're pretty upfront, they're, they're forthcoming, they're updating you on their observations and concerns um, at, on a regular basis, meaning in, in real time so that you can either provide that additional context that explains away the issue or, which happens, um, you know, allows you to address it while, you know, at the time so that it, by the time the exam is over, has essentially, you know, the examiners can, can, can say in their report it's been taken care of, which, which really does go a long way. That, that said, not all, um, at least in my experience, um, exam teams are that forthcoming in real time. There's a lot of reasons for, for that, but um, in, in that case, you kind of need to um, try to suss it out in other ways, either by, you know, being more uh, proactive and, and asking 
or um, you know, trying to reading between the lines. What are they asking about? What in, in all the dozens or maybe hundreds of additional requests that you're getting, are there themes that are that are percolating? Um, are there questions that they're asking your business people that that continue to come up? Um, or when you look at the stuff that you've turned over, when you look at the at the consumer transactional data that was that was sent, or you listen to the call recordings that were sent, you know, from trying to sit in their shoes, um, what are you seeing and hearing, and what? And that takes a lot of resources for sure. But to the extent you can get ahead of that and try to address it, um, is is really the best way to, to mitigate any fallout. And the importance of that is, is worst case scenario, you're laying the groundwork for an appeal because if those facts aren't in the record uh, at the early stages and everything's treated as uh, less something less than a fulsome uh, correspondence with the bureau or with the exam team, uh, and you get to the point where you have matters requiring attention um, that you do not agree with. Uh, and you get a PAR letter, which could be basically uh, foreshadowing an enforcement action, that's the time uh, to presumably wrap up with a bow all of the advocacy, all of the facts that have been put into the record, and get that in front of everyone and anyone that it needs to be in front of, um, but not to start from the beginning then, but to have already laid that groundwork early on. Now, there is the exam process. Um, we've done uh, appeals where appeals have been successful. We've seen appeals get shot down. There's no public statistics on or rhyme or reason necessarily, but oftentimes it's a misunderstanding of the facts or an interpretation of the law that's contrary to uh, prior precedent, really, that finally gets elevated to a high enough level within the Bureau that somebody makes a call on it that is in the company's favor. But up until then, it's no, no, no. Andrew, you've been in front of the appeals panels uh, with us. How does that play out? Yeah, so I mean, normally, um, obviously, the, the starting point is deciding that you want to appeal uh, something in uh, an examination report or a supervisory letter. And there are some limits as to what you can, um, what you can appeal. Uh, but generally, once you make that decision and, and you let the Bureau know, um, it would involve kind of submitting a written explanation as to um, you know, why you're appealing, the, the important facts that are at issue, why you believe that um, the examiners um, are, are wrong on this particular issue. Um, you have a right to request uh, an oral presentation, uh, which is really um, almost in some ways uh, like a, um, a uh, Supre Supreme Court briefing in, in some respects. Um, you get a certain period of time to, to go before this uh, committee that includes you know, senior management um, from the Bureau and present your case. Um, and there's you know, different ways to do it. Maybe it's with a PowerPoint presentation. Maybe it's less formal. But the point there is really to try to um, get the facts out, explain your position and the law and why you believe um, that you're, you're right. Um, it's a confidential process. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, it's not an impossible process. But I think that in a lot of cases, um, the examiners, uh, you know, the examination report that comes out is going to have been reviewed by headquarters. It's going to have gone through, you know, some approval processes. And whatever the positions that are there, I think, are going to have been vetted. And really, if the facts are not going to change, if there aren't errors that you can point to in the record, um, it might be difficult to convince uh, the committee to um, to change an interpretation of law that you may not agree with. And there may also be simultaneously enforcement attorneys uh, saber rattling on a potential public enforcement action. And at some point, it potentially could lead to litigation. And uh, both uh, appealing the appeal and, and ultimately the exam findings and, uh, and potentially a, a public taking basically what was private and turning it public. And certainly we've seen that in instances like the PHH case? I, um, I think a, an interesting question maybe for Alex and for Gary to get their perspectives on too is, and we've touched on this a little bit, is you know, what, at what point in this process does a company decide, hey, we think that we did make a mistake here in remediation or proactively you know, actually 
going back to consumers and making them whole, when do you make that determination and is it something that, that is beneficial or not from the, uh, from the Bureau's perspective? So um, I'll take a swipe at this. There's no perfect answer, um, but you know, my advice is pretty consistent, which is if you're a, particularly if you're a supervised institution, you're in this for the long game, um, you're going to be examined for the rest of your uh, life as an institution and that being as transparent uh, and um, speedy with disclosing when you have problems builds long-term trust. Um, obviously, there are legal considerations as it relates to certain in instances, but I've encouraged people to come forward once they have a real understanding of the facts. So what I don't, what I've tried to encourage people not to do is they find some small problem and they haven't figured out what it is and they, somebody rings a bell and they go talk to an examiner and they don't really even know what their problem is. Usually I've, I've said to people, have a scope of the problem, have laid out a plan what you think would be reasonable remediation, lay out a schedule by which you plan to do that, what the expense is. So then you're talking about details as opposed to having this broad, open-ended conversation where no one seems to know the facts. So you can get out ahead of it. I, I think you Create have your own to. plan rather than... I, mean, I, I tell people, too, this gets back to examinations. If someone inside your institution is not better than the examiner on the ground from the CFPB about what's going on in your institution every day, you're never going to be successful as an examined institution okay. um, because you have to know what's going on inside the institution, what's happening to the consumer. I even have clients when they're undertaking a complex transaction, whether it's a merger or particularly for services who are onboarding new portfolios, I actually have them build monthly reports that are not requested by the CFPB, that are sent over to the CFPB on a monthly basis to show the progress, show any things they've had to do, any kind of remediation. Obviously, their law, as someone who's not a lawyer, I don't make any legal approval, but in consultation with a law firm, that's sent over. And in that particular case, you know, it was one of the largest student loan transactions in the last 10 years and end up being no problem. No surprises. No surprises because the Bureau knows on a monthly basis this is what's happening. Yeah, and I think that no surprises concept is really important too. I mean, when you have all these different drivers of standards and expectations from the Bureau, uh, for companies to be as organized about handling an exam as they are on the day-to-day -day CMS and also just as organized as the Bureau. So you've got both the legal department, the compliance department, subject matter experts in all the different areas, like so for instance, who handles the consumer complaints at an organization, whoever that person is should be plugged into the exam, not just because complaints are going to be asked about, but because it's all part of that CMS feedback loop, which also can create the environment for remediation if necessary, but also at, at a minimum, careful deliberation about what courses of actions to take. Uh, on the fly as an exam is unfolding and to your point, Gary, uh, if product development or portfolio purchases or sales, everybody has to have that same seat at the table because the Bureau is going to have somebody that is an expert in each of those areas having a, a seat at the table. Yeah. And I just think clients, I haven't seen a client yet who's succeeded by holding back and then fighting later. I mean, that you usually end up in the D.C. circuit. I mean, that's where that type of approach ends up. And, so we've seen you might win there, but that's a very long, expensive route when sometimes it's just purely communication. And a, pu and a public route. Very public. We touched on consumer complaints and the stakes of enforcement action. What I think is would be useful for the audience is to hear a little bit about how everything ties together, um, strategies for dealing with an exam holistically. We've touched on a lot of the different themes today um, and a lot of the different sources of what the law and the expectations are of the Bureau. There's no shortage of information out there about that. But practically, you know, what's on the horizon? Um, and the CFPB has already predicted that they uh, could be sharing information not just with states but also um, sort of ramping up in that regard. They're changing some of the confidentiality rules related to exam information and investigation information so that way they can share it more widely and restrict companies ability to do that. There's a Federal Register notice that just had a comment period closing recently. Uh, they've just re-signaled that service providers uh, are subject to essentially the same CMS requirements as the supervised entities. 
um, although perhaps with a, quote, tailored approach to risk. Um, but still, um, lots of different issues out there, some practical observations. Alex? Sure. Well, a few, a few things. The one, and this, you know, in terms of tying the theme of today's webinar is, is that yes, while there is overlap between supervision and enforcement, the supervision matter can lead to a public enforcement action. Um, you know, going into uh, an exam, do not treat it like um, you would treat, you know, a receipt of a subpoena or a civil investigative demand. Um, the, the goals are different. Um, the, the the way it unfolds is different. Um, and and as we met, keep trying to hammer it, hammer home, it is a long-term relationship, and it should be built on cooperation, trust, and transparency. You know, e even if sometimes you feel like you're getting you're getting stung. And so while it's important to keep in mind the consequences of of you know violations being unearthed during an examination and having those antenna and guards up, you do want to treat the examination like an examination and, and kind of, you know, and that's, that has a host of tactical issues you can discuss about how to, how, what that means, but, you know, kind of from a top level, you know, that's, that's something really important. Um, second, second point that I would just make is that we talk about, um, you know, CTV kind of cooperating or disclosing information to other agencies. I mean, for, for entities that are um, you know, supervised or, or regulated by multiple government entities, whether on state or multiple federal agencies, you want to have a holistic approach to compliance. And so whether, you know, it's, it's have, think about compliance to the letter of the law that you are um, responsible for complying with, but also having that kind of consumer perspective that the CFPB uniquely is very, very focused on. And so when you think about building a CMS, to address what we discussed today, you want to keep in mind all those other moving pieces as well. Yeah, I think consumer complaints is something that um, frustrates a fair amount of my clients um, because they feel that the, the actual number of complaints for their institution or even the project as a whole is unbelievably small when you think about the billions or even trillions of transactions that occur. I think that's an interesting philosophical conversation, but from a practical standpoint, is really not a place where I would a lot of my effort. Uh, I personally download uh, the entire database on a daily basis. I have pivot tables to look at it across every single product, every single uh, producer because in order to help my clients, I'm trying to look for where there are, there are issues and um, I encourage my clients to do the same. One of the things is think about the things that you're adjacent to as much as what you're in. Um, you know, I always describe it as like, you may have a very clean factory, but if the factory next to you is full of rags and catches on fire, that, that can end up catching you on fire. Even you may be in a totally unrelated business, but if you're approximate, um, trying to be mindful of how the people in the ecosystem are behaving and the problems they're seeing, you need to be able to show immediately when you're asked, these are not activities we, we, we engage in or consumers misunderstanding what's happening. If there's not a direct relationship between Compliance management systems, complaints, product design, and at the very top of the institution, people don't understand what complaints are occurring. That is something that's problematic. And just on a practical level, you know, every enforcement supervisory um, memo that goes to the director has all of the complaint statistics on it about that institution when it goes to the director. So that is a frame through which every single activity is seen. And that brings us back to that consumer perspective. Right. Yeah, I think um, my, my closing point would be um, if you haven't been uh, examined yet by the CFPB, don't wait until you get that first uh, letter of notice to start preparing. Um, you can have a great compliance department, um, but if you haven't actually gone through the examination, uh, you may not be ready for it. And to do some kind of um, you know, prep work where you actually can maybe step out of your day-to-day -day compliance shoes and look at your program as a whole as the examiners might, that will really help you not only um, prepare for an exam when it finally does come, but it might even help you find ways to improve your, your program in the meantime by, by looking through somebody else's shoes. And lastly, I would just say, see this on the positive side, um, you can create competitive advantage and sustainable profitability by being better at this part of your business. Uh, and there are many ways in which it doesn't feel that way at the time, but 
if done right, you can have better insights about your customer, what your customer's needs are, and what their outcomes are. And I think there are ways to do this that sort of everyone's better off. It's just a painful process uh, to, to get to that end state. Well, that brings us to the top of the hour. We'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Stand by for the CLE code. Um, but uh, for those interested, later today, a quick plug. Um, our advertising practice is going to be having a webinar on native advertising and influencer marketing. That's a half-day workshop taking place in Los Angeles with a webinar component that's going to start at 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern. Feel free to go to our website and to find out additional details as well as also to sign up for the information. That also will be available on the web and for download later this week. Gary, thanks very much for joining us. Appreciate the insight, the insider view from the CFPB now at Chambridge Partners. And a thank you to Alex and Andrew for joining us as well with your insights from surviving and also preparing for CFPB exams. Thank you to our web team that put this together for us. And thank you to our attendees for joining. And please check out our other recent webinars and presentations and articles on our firm website and the Venable YouTube channel. Have a great afternoon.